Hi, North. Thanks for joining me today, friend. Hi, Tashin. It is uh, really lovely to see you and, and a real treat to have you on the podcast. I've, um, you know, you and I have been friends and, and colleagues working together for over a year now, right? Like uh, something like 14 months or something like that. Yeah, a mutual, it's a uh, tribute to the internet and to <laughs> friends. A mutual friend introduced us and we met on the phone and and spent a whole year working together remotely before we finally met. And it's been a it's been a real joy and I've come to really admire you. Mm. More Likewise, and more. friend. Yeah. Likewise. Uh, I'm really excited to kind of share with the world what you're up to and, and who you are and what your teachings are. So it's it's a real privilege to have you here. And um, maybe just to start, could you sort of introduce yourself and tell us about your background and your life story? And you can answer that at whatever length you like and in whatever way you want to share, but just telling us about yourself and your life. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I've ever actually told you about my life before, mm -hmm. which is uh, kind of refreshing in a way, mm. but also I think, I think that it's, I was thinking I had that, you know, a story, um, a story is important too, you know, the, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I was born in San Francisco, and uh, I was adopted from birth, and um, uh, really um, was a very kind of joyful child, they say, like, it was very kind of gregarious and very curious, asking people questions. Um, and when I was uh, a teenager, I realized that I was gay. And that was um, really kind of unacceptable to my mind at that time. It was, it was like hearing that I'd had cancer or so, have cancer or something. Um, that's how it landed for me in my mind. And it really set off a, um, an intense kind of turning inward and withdrawing from uh, contact. When I was 15, I uh, dropped out of school, which was, uh, yeah, and really upsetting to my parents and uh, spent a lot of time in my room, um, just walking, go walk the dog every day and, um, and uh, very much in my, in my own thoughts. And um, yeah, so uh, during that time, uh, though, even though it was, I was kind of a mess, I when, when, when my mom in particular would ask me like, what's, what's going on? I would say, I don't really know, but I'm following this jewel in my heart. So there was this, it was like that, that uh, kind of very relatable, ordinary suffering that I was going through of not of the process of coming out sparked something, that suffering sparked something where I really turned inward and was like looking in it, it was like, oh, there's some possibility here, but I didn't have a context for it. I didn't know how to articulate it at all which was kind of dysfunctional, but I called it this jewel. And so later, a, a few years later, I basically stumbled on a wonderful Zen master. And, um, and when I saw him, my th I thought he sees the same jewel and he's found a way to express it. It was an immediate recognition. Um, and later I learned that, that the a jewel is, is often the, the image that's given for bodhicitta. Um, so, um, yeah, meeting, meeting this teacher sparked a whole journey and journey into the Dharma, long retreats, uh, initially in the insight meditation tradition, then later in, in Soto Zen and monastic communities there, other places. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the, and, and, and in there I started teaching. That's kind of the overall arc, um, mm. arc of things. Mm. And, and I mentioned the stuff in the beginning of how I was as a child, because I feel like I, in a way I'm, I'm coming back to some of those qualities, um, especially over the last 10 years, that curiosity, that connection with others it was really a journey of disconnecting, not knowing how to relate authentically, finding some authenticity and then uh, coming back um, with, with that kind of enough inner confidence to be able to just be be here, which can be so scary, I think, for a lot of people in, in their own ways. Mm. Beautiful. Can you say, I, I feel like it's pretty unusual 
when for people when they realize i mean i i don't know i haven't been through this myself but as most of the stories that i hear about people you know realizing their sexual identity like often the sort of stigma is external and i wonder if you could say more about what the like sort of internal you know judgment that you found was like why that was unacceptable to you yeah you know i think i think in a way it was like internalized external not that i'm blaming other people but i think there was this sense of when you're when they're yet that young there's such a sense that it's almost like probably deep in us that's like i i the little duckling that's following the bigger ducks like i this is how you be in the world mm. um, <laughs> and it didn't fit that image like wife and kids it mm. didn't fit that image in my mind um so it was asking me to be authentic and i didn't know how to be be that at that time um so um you know it was it was an interesting difference because people were very accepting around me i went to an art school in san francisco people were like you know yeah you know when, when they when i had my i started to have my first boyfriend when i was 15 and when the school found out that was like almost like a short circuit for me i was just like i just i'm just not ready to i don't know how to show up and uh so that's when i dropped out of school mm. wow wow yeah <clears throat> and you know, of course, we'll come back to the Dharma portion, but what was your journey with that afterwards? Like, when, yeah. when, when did you come out or fully or like, how has that evolved for you over time? Yeah, you know, I actually started to come out um, on uh, my first long insight meditation retreat to the teachers, you mm -hmm. know, it's just so healing to just say, okay, this is, this is a fact. And it was so easy um, in that setting. Um, and then slowly more to friends, I when I first moved away from home, I started to come out to my circle of friends there and that felt very good. And, and um, but I still, you know, it was, it was really not until I really um, dived deeply into practice that I, and, and, and moved into the San Francisco Zen Center uh, to that really strong community that um, it felt important to be open about this with my family, with everyone. And, not have it be something I felt I needed to like sit someone down and tell them, um, you know, and like many people, it was such a, it was so healing to just have that not be an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. It's uh, feels, feels important. So um, can you say as well, just kind of what your journey with the practice side of things has been and like, which, which sort of, traditions you've worked with and and how you understand the unfolding of the dharma in your life yeah um that's a long mm -hmm. that's a long story but yes. uh, and um yeah it's a long story and it feels important to say that it is a story uh you know which you can you know i can i can weave different stories um but really you know what um feels what feels most alive is just the nowness of practice you know that uh that quality of nowness of hereness um and appre appreciating that appreciating that connection um maybe maybe i somehow want to start there just this uh sense of for me it was so much about uh for so much of my karma and another part of my karma was like what's going to be my mark on the world mm. um you know that was I, I think for good and for bad my mom really encouraged that a lot as a young kid and um you know it's, it's like if i you know played a nice song it was like okay i'm gonna write the best song and you know that kind of thing and then cause a lot of stress for myself rather than just play the song and so I was, I would try, I, I, in my life, I kind of tried out these different things. It was like music, acting, writing, different things. Um, and at some point in that inquiry of what do I really want to do? I was lucky to have this, and I kind of made this time and space for myself to think about uh, as a, in my early twenties to think about what do I really want to do? And at some point I thought I want to be helpful to others. And that was when I really thought about it. That's what I wanted. And I actually went to that same Zen teacher uh, who I mentioned before. And I think it was our first sit down conversation. And I said, you know, I think my deepest intention 
is to be helpful to others, but I don't know uh, what to do. Because in my mind, it was kind of like, okay, I could imagine being like a, a Gandhi or, yeah, <laughs> or you know, the, the, that, that's my image of someone who's helpful to others. But I, you know, what, what was my thing? I didn't know. So he said, um, maybe just keep letting go and, uh, and then you'll know what to do. And so somehow that connected with me and drove me and sort of supported me in sitting more long retreats and really with this strong intention to be here, to be present, that somehow I would maybe find out what to do through that. Um, sorry for the beep. Yeah, so through, yeah, so, and I really found that to be true. So it, it gave, and it gave me a lot of energy because the practice was connected with my deepest intention. You know, I want, I want to be here from the depths of my heart, uh, bringing that to uh, practice on long retreat. Um, and at some point it became easier to be present, to be here. And that brought, that was a shift in aspiration, um, shift in vow where it's no longer something out there but it's something that is in a sense manifesting, even though there's still an aspirational quality, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not, there's no more this sense of self out that, that I'm gonna improve or change or get there. It's like discovering that the thing that I'm looking for is right here. And that's, and it's, um, that's very fulfilling uh, in a way that I think makes me more available in an authentic way, it makes me more available to others. And um, uh, so after that shift happened, I went and studied with different teachers, lived in different monasteries, uh, did more retreat practice. I still do retreat practice um, and, and began to grow as a teacher as well. And just in my life in general, life of practice, they weren't separate anymore. And who were some of the different teachers that you worked with over the years? Um, yeah, there've been, there've been a lot. And mm -hmm. I feel, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, this uh, three month retreat that I was teaching this past spring, I kept feeling more and more gratitude for uh, having, for whatever reason I was drawn to spend time with these people. And I'm so, yeah, be, so before I talk about specific people, um, I think I was thinking about why did I why did I study with all these different people, and I realized that in my mind at the time um, there was this sense of like oh I'm learning this I, I'm sort of uh, getting some of the dust off of this particular manifestation of dharma. This person's you know playful, like, you know, Tanisra is very playful, or uh, Leslie James, the abiding teacher of Tassajara, she's like a rock, and um, in the river of people that come through there, um, you know, or, you know, Gil Fransdale is so kind of um, creative, and he's like a reflecting pond for people, and um, Reb Anderson is so still and so um, confident in his expression of the Dharma, um, an awakening, um, or Kaz Tanahashi, who's this old man who's so joyful um, and just does every idea that comes into his mind. Um, I think as it, you know, most of this was in my twenties, early thirties, and this sense of, oh, I'm, but really, you know, I'm, I'm getting some from, something from these people, but really what I think it was more in hindsight is learning or what I learned from all of those people wasn't getting those qualities. It was learning to be myself more fully. That each of those people was the Dharma coming through their personality. And there's something deep in us that, deep in me, and I think deep in all of us, um, the more I get to know people, that that's one of our basic problems is, is just, um, it's not quite okay to be me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I think, you know, that, that hereness, that that being hereness, that is healed from that. It's healed from that. It's like willing. It's willing to be here, actually. So it was being with those teachers. It was like learning, warm hand to warm hand, person to person. Somehow bringing bringing that understanding more fully into being. It's okay to be this person. It's actually great to you know. It's actually the the place to be. 
And that doesn't mean I can't keep learning, growing, changing, make mistakes and all of that. Mm. That's so those are some of the here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> it's okay. And and the and the all these teachers um, that I mentioned. Um, also Joseph Goldstein was another one um, who I worked with on retreat and then reached out to later and um, wanted to. You know, even with him, I wanted to learn uh, like the details of Vipassana practice so that I could be a better teacher. And, you know, mostly when we meet, it's very spontaneous. And I feel like he's just, he's just um, like all of these teachers in their own way, just resonating with transmitting basic okayness and that basic joy in practice, joy in being here. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Can you say more about this shift that happened for you in your practice? Yeah. Um, yeah, at some point, you know, the, the poem that's coming into my mind now is from uh, the Zen uh, teacher Ikkyu. And it's, it says, the temple bell stops but the sound keeps coming out of the flowers. Mm. Um, so uh, this temple bell came to a stop mm. and um, maybe that makes sense to people listening to this or maybe it doesn't, so I could say more. But basically this, you know, the temple bell stopped. Somehow this, this movement of, um, this deep, deep, deep inner movement of um, dukkha or or kind of anxiety wiggling from being here, that came to a rest, and so that that um, that can that was for me like a being turned inside out, um, and it was it was like a, a being birthed completely into a new kind of um, life. Really, it, it was like a total reset. Um, and not into just a life of making more karma, but really into a life of practice, a life that is grounded in in empty space that's full of that's full of form. The sound keeps coming out of the flowers. So um, yeah, and I could I could say more, but that's kind of the what the preceded gist. that shift for you. Yeah. Um, well. Uh, the story, the story that I told, and um, really coming into long retreat in, I think in the in there's there's a number of things I want to kind of say about this, but basically, most immediately, what preceded it was a long retreat. I'd gone to sit a long three month uh, vipassana retreat, and then from there went on to a place called the Forest Refuge for eight months or more is what I signed up for. So really just diving in, um, but really not with the sense of like, oh, I'm gonna have this special experience. It was really just, um, you know, with that precious mind of a beginner, that's just like, oh yeah, this Satipatthana thing seems great. And like, I, maybe I'll get a little, <laughs> I'll get a little more concentration, maybe. Um, you know, reflect deeply on my deepest aspiration, kind of no sense of um, that that kind of uh, transformation was imminent. Mm -hmm. But just diving in, it's like, I want to learn the four foundations of mindfulness. Um, you know, liberation wasn't on my radar, not really. At some point it was, but mostly it was just trying to, you know, I'd seen enough through meditation and the retreats that I'd done, that it was very clear that uh, and also from the reflecting on aspirations, very clear that um, this was the only thing that mattered, you know, mm. being present. Mm. One of the things that's uh, struck me throughout our interactions is just that you're willing to talk about this and that you are clear and straightforward about it when other people might be more oblique or indirect. And yeah. I wonder uh, why you choose to be direct and speak freely and clearly about this. Yeah, part of it's part of it's a little bit window dressing. 
be, like, uh, you know, I, I, I am a teacher and I do want to um, uh, work with students, you know? And so I've seen teachers who are very direct in the way that I'm being, and I've also seen and deeply appreciated teachers who are very oblique. And mm -hmm. so I don't think that this is the one best way but one of the things I saw um, is, although the obliqueness is kind of beautiful, um, sometimes it can, it can actually seem like it's coming from a place of humility, but it actually can be coming from personal insecurity, mm -hmm. even in some really good teachers and good pe practitioners. I think that's what I observe. And it can have the effect of, um, of um, not teaching clearly to students who actually want <laughs> the teaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the caveat that I think that at some point, it's, not a, it's really not about words. So you can have the clearest words and miss the meaning. And so that's why I think ob oblique expression can be, the, in some ways, can be a, the clearest expression if there's that heart resonance. But I think just um, over these last 12 years since that experience, um, I've really, yeah, studied with different teachers, tried different ways, and I found that that more ob oblique expression um, can actually just shroud the Dharma unnecessarily. And that's isolating for me. And it's actually isolating for others. The only thing that prevents us from awakening is erroneous ideas about awakening as some special high remote thing that's somewhere else than where we are. It's, it's related to not being here and appreciating where we are. So I think, you know, and the, the more I expressed clearly and directly, the more I appreciate that that's what the Buddha was doing. That's what a lot of great teachers have done is really say, this is it, just this is it. And they just express what they've realized for themselves, what they've realized is a fancy word, but they just express what they've learned about how to be here and how to be okay and happy and connected. And that's, a, that's like the glad tidings. That's a good thing to share. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to stay close to that um, sentiment because I see that it's useful. It's useful for me to feel that, that the this realization or awakening is not some high special separate thing it's actually um its nature is is settled and open and connected mm. and something we share i'm experiencing a confusion as i hear you talk about this because um on the one hand the way you're talking about it, it's like this is ordinary and present like it's something that's here right now yes. and yes uh also like that there's a shift that happened and like there was a time where that wasn't available to you and then it became your experience and yes. i wonder how to fit those two things together like what what exactly is this shift such that it's ordinary and it could not be present for someone or they might not have had that shift or insight. Yeah, yeah, I was actually just talking with someone, a neighbor friend yesterday, and she started asking um, about enlightenment mm -hmm. and uh, she'd never done that before. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as I was talking about it in a very similar way, she was like, yeah, she was like, that's what I want. She mm -hmm. was like, that's the most important thing. But then she actually started crying because of the same thing. She said, but why is, she said, it was interesting. She said, it's not fair. Uh, why is that not, why do you have to go sit along retreat to get that someday? And um, I, I mean, so, you know, I said something like, I don't think that's quite, to her, I said, I don't think that's quite the way to, to think about it in terms of it's not fair, but it's just one example. You know, with her, it was about it's not fair, but it's just one example of, there's deeply stuck ideas that we have about ourselves that that it, we have to work through, basically, you know, or we have to um, we have to enfold into our practice 
fully. Um, so we have to practice. We have and that, that, that's that's basically, you know, the koan of of uh, Zen master Dogen, Dogen too. You know, this like his question when he went to China. Um, you know, if if the teaching is that this is always available and it's everywhere, um, you know what what's the role of practice? Um, but you know, you you have to you have to <laughs> so <laughs> you have to. And it doesn't mean what you think it means. Also, it doesn't mean um, this like thing that you do, you know, for X amount of time each day, or this special life that you build. It's not prompted. Awakening is awakening is when there's so many different ways to say it, but it's more of a surrender to what's already here. So, but what does it take to what does it take to actually surrender in that way? That is where practice comes alive because that directly confronts you, you know one's deepest um operating principles motivations basic kind of stance of being or orientation of being um yeah so it's, you have to work through that mm -hmm. authentically and it's even more deep than like just doing a method although methods can help it's really closer to like deepest aspiration or vow. Um, yeah, something that brings all of us together on the moment. Can you say more about how you understand aspirations? Yeah. Um, uh, first, does that, does that make sense or am I, ma am I making sense? Yeah, I'm hearing both that this is very ordinary and present and that uh, because of the way our minds work and different ideas that we hold on to, we have to practice to realize that again and again, something something like that. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, aspiration, so I said some about it already in terms of how powerful it's been, been for me. Um, you know, I, uh, I think of different things. I, I remember uh, the practice period that I sat at Tassajara with uh, Reb Anderson, who's a disciple of Suzuki Roshi. Um, he gathered everyone together in the beginning of the practice period in a different space than the Zendo. Um, and we all sat around in a circle. And he said, um, in his way, that's very kind of compelling, he said, you have to tell me what you really want. Hmm. And he went around to each person. And it was so interesting to see, because ostensibly we were all there for the same thing. Hmm. You know, and I so anyway, I, I once ripped this off when I when I taught a group of kids uh, on the small community where I live. Hmm. Um, I was invited to teach some kids. And I went, I did the same thing. I said, you know, tell me what you really want. And it was quite interesting. Also, the first person said, I want to go home. The next person said that he wanted an iron suit and a million dollars. And so it's like um, that question, that question actually gets right to those ideas that are operating underneath the surface that I'm talking about, the things that, um, you know, because I could be tired and I could even maybe I've never wanted an iron suit and a million dollars, but I could want that and actually be very, very present. I could say, okay, I have that desire. I have that emotion or whatever, that feeling. But what I really want is to be here and to, with a generous heart and a patient heart and a non-clinging heart. That's what I really want. Um, so uh, one more story that it comes to mind to just kind of clarify this, uh, which came from Gil Fransdale is um, he, he's practiced in both traditions of uh, Theravada and Mahayana. And after he'd done a long transformative insight retreats, he came back to uh, his Zen, the Zen community and said, hey guys, we don't talk about our meditation practice in any detail here, what's going on? Uh, because at the insight retreats, it's like, oh, well, I got this and that and then these blah, blah, blah. And, um, and uh, no one said anything, he said. But then later, uh, a very senior teacher came up to him and said, you know, Gil, um, 
here we clarify our deepest aspiration and then that clarifies the meditation. Mm. And Gil says, oh, well, that's, he's found that that, that to be true. Um, and he's a very skilled teacher in both traditions. So there's this reflexive relationship um, or this, they're both reflecting two sides of this, the same thing. Um, that's some of what I'd say about aspiration. Mm. There's a question that's coming about this that's like, I'm not sure how to put it into words, but like, what what is an aspiration? Like, does everyone have one or uh, what is its relation to being alive or being a human or something like that? Uh, forgive me for not being able to say this more clearly, but uh, something like that. Yeah. I forgive you, but can you tell me more of what you, <laughs> what can you say more kind of what you mean? Yes. Uh, is an aspiration something that everyone has, or is it something that you develop or yeah. uh, grow, or how do you yeah. see that? Well, I'm actually curious what you think, because you, you wrote a beautiful, a beautiful essay on aspiration no, when I read it, I thought, oh, wow. You, 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 so I think you, you've articulated some things. What do you, what do you think? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> and then uh -oh. I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> OK. I'm worried that you answering will be tarnished by how I see it. But uh, OK, we'll go. We'll go with this. Please. I'll trust you. <laughs> uh, well, the thing that I, I, like, has been confusing is that one way that this might be talked about is like, oh, you have some destiny or some externally imposed thing that already exists that's like your, you know, intrinsic, right. it's some intrinsic property that you have, or some fate that you will realize externally or something, or like God has decreed that this is what your life is about or something. And yeah. that hasn't really been my own experience. It's been much more like, wandering down a road and seeing where the road leads yeah 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 well i agree with that <laughs> wandering i mean because to me it's it's hard to talk about this because aspiration is so alive i think the closer we are to aspiration i mean zen has a talks about inquiry now I think aspiration is close to inquiry because and it's connected to what I was saying about, you know, what is your deepest intention? What is your deepest aspiration? We have all kinds of inquiries. Like, should I have, um, you know, this morning I was inquiring if the cup of coffee I was drinking was too big. That is a little inquiry of the day, but that's, that's not really my deepest inquiry. Um, and um, when we really, my experience is when I really probe into what is the deepest thing, it's like it, um, it, uh, you know, it it's, goes into the territory of not knowing. In Zen, they say not knowing is most intimate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's connected with the thing about being here. It's like, we think we know. That's the other thing is that, yeah, it's like, oh, oh, the aspiration that's ordained by God or that is like my destiny, you know, those can be very compelling. Those can be super compelling. And some of the deeper ones, you know, coffee is a sort of silly example. But how about like some of that, the deeper layer of like, I um, could even be like, I'm going to live a long life. Maybe I'm not, you know, I, I once had a near death experience and it was so profound to let go of that deep layer of an idea temporarily mm -hmm. that, um, that I was going to have this long life with all these people and get to resolve things with everybody. Um, so there's deeper, deeper layers, but I think I would say that, and I would say tentatively because it'd be an insult to that aspiration to say for sure, but I would say tentatively that the deepest layer is, uh, is like in the territory of not knowing, it's in the territory of being here. Um, I don't know, and I'm just thinking out loud, but maybe it's, maybe it's, um, To be with that or to appreciate that um, means we have to appreciate something 
or bring forth some some quality. Um, yeah, that's tender. Like that's what's coming to my mind now. It's mm. tender with this life, you know, as as it is, which is what I've, which is where meditation's about, really. That's the, um, yeah, that's tender with this life, just as it is. That um, capacity within to be present without an agenda because the, ag the agendas are what taint that pure aspiration. Mm. And yet I would say that, that there's also something about this aspiration that has been celebrated for thousands of years as compassionate, as containing within it this vow to liberate all beings. But um, I, think we, I think it's useful to inquire, what does that really mean to liberate all beings? Um, you know, and, um, and I think it's, again, it's just pointing to awareness. Mm. Mm. And is it something everyone has? Yes, definitely. <laughs> everyone has it, but <laughs> yeah, everyone. <laughs> yeah, that was your initial question. <laughs> you know, uh, does that dog have a Buddha nature? <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. One asks indirectly about oneself. Um, yeah, when I first heard about this concept, it was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I have one of those. I don't. I don't know if I have that compassion within me. Uh, it said it said that I do, but where is it? I, I don't where know that it? I do. Uh, you know, uh, maybe I'm lacking in this. Maybe I'm the one being in the world that lacks this <laughs> compassion that is referred to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's so, yeah, it's, it's paradoxical, like so many things in spiritual practice, but it's like um, that we have to learn that from other people um we learn it from other people this is it's other people warm hand to warm hand they bring us the teachings the teachers they community they can point out this this possibility and yet what's paradoxical is that as that comes to the fore we become more and i would say we become more and more um independent and authentic like the buddha talks about someone becoming independent in the dharma as a sign of spiritual maturity so that so um yeah there's that interesting kind of uh tension how did you come to teach yeah well uh the first thing is just to say that uh you know what like what is what is teaching um There, there's, I think I'm growing more and more into being a teacher in the sense of a role that I'm holding in some conscious way or that's somehow coming, um, somehow just arising in relationship to how people are coming to me, something like that. Um, you know, something you can see. But it felt like with that, you know, with that experience that I described, um, or that transformation from before, uh, that was the clear beginning of what I like to think about more as like transmission, um, which is a can seem like kind of a grand word, but it's very um, it's a useful word I think um, to transmit um, to be. It's the teaching that comes through from practicing you know, the, the, for, through everyday life. And that's not really, that's not necessarily con conscious. That's just, um, uh, and, and, you know, I think this is important to mention because like, you know, one of those teachers that I mentioned, Leslie James, uh, she said that after teaching for 40 years at Tassajara, she thought that, um, that like 95% of her value was not through what she said. Um, it was just from practicing with others and doing her practice. Um, and in a sense, that is, um, yeah, uh, I was gonna say, well, in a sense, that's complete. That has a quality of completeness to it. Um, so it's important to mention this, I think, because because um, 
they say there's no teacher of Zen. It's like, uh, that's been a koan for me for 10 years or less so now, but it really was a koan for like 10 years is don't teach. <laughs> um, that's how I became a teacher was mm. to try to understand the impulse to, to teach and how that was kind of um, to a little bit separate, a little bit separate um, my karmic mind that has an idea. I have something and you don't and I'm going to try to teach you a little bit, try to understand that, even have a little more space around that to appreciate the, the nature of this awakening, that it is actually shared and to um, bring forth the teaching, bring forth the teaching, you know, to clearly communicate, to understand what is it, what is it that I'd realized really and that's, I think that's a process that a lot of teachers go through. And maybe at first they realize, here's a story um, <laughs> that I heard uh, from uh, Tasahara. Um, there was some old teacher from Japan who came to, to be there. And they, at that time, they used the stick to, um, you know, help wake people up uh, from sleeping in the meditation hall. Uh, they don't use it anymore. But um, yeah, so he didn't use it. He, he would just stand there, I guess. And uh, the, the head of the meditation hall said, you know, uh, why don't you use that? And he said, they'll wake up on their own. <laughs> <laughs> and so <he> was, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it just kind of conveys uh, his like maturity in practice. He'd grown more into, he was just still growing more. It's like into that appreciation. Oh, they'll wake up on their own. Uh, he'd softened. It's like uh, he wasn't he wasn't the teacher. Mm. But the more I've softened, the more teaching opportunities have arisen, <laughs> and the more directly I've communicated. What is the vision for your project and the retreats that you're running? Yeah, it's been my dream for a long time to offer and the kind of conditions that were so useful for me practicing. And I remember when I uh, sat my first three month retreat at uh, Insight Meditation Society, I remember going to uh, Joseph Goldstein and saying, uh, I feel like I've gone to Hogwarts. Mm. Um, this is like, this is, this is what I um, felt so, un I'm getting here what I felt so unsatisfied and so lacking in, you know, academic school, for example. Um, so um, it's really it's really offering conditions for, uh, in my own way, um, for the same thing. And I think um, basically, you know, we just finished our first three month uh, practice period, uh, which is like a it's like a Zen session or a Vipassana retreat. You know, so. so basically alternating sitting and walking meditation all day long, um, except for meals and little breaks and sleeping and living in silence. So totally, you're not looking at each other, you're not talking uh, except to me for a short meeting about the meditation. You hear a Dharma talk once a day, maybe a little instructions in the morning. Sometimes there's some sort of guided meditation. So there's some structure that that to, to contextualize things and help with keeping the practice going and deepening. But basically you're going and, and, and you feel each other, you know, it's a small group of people practicing together. Um, you know, this past practice period was, I think the most we got up to was six at a time. Some of those people were here for three months. Some of those people came for shorter periods, like you came for a week. Um, so you've, you've tasted what it is. Um, but yeah, it's basically intensive intensive retreat for those who know what that is for um, a three month period. And and we're doing it in a small, it's a roving project. So like we have a land that we're able to do it on now for the next um, year. Um, and after that, we have to find a new space. Um, but uh, yeah, currently we have space that we're doing it in that we have done it. It's, like tried and true. We're planning to do two of these 
one for three months and one for two months uh, in 2023. And um, another just another aspect of it um, is that it's all Donna based, um, which was important to me for a lot of reasons um, and has brought a lot of uh, joy and surprise into uh, into the project. Mm. Can you say in case people aren't familiar what that means that it's all Donna based? So yeah, it's generosity based. It's um, that's the traditional Buddhist practice. Um, that my understanding it arose in the context of ancient India, where um, people would just support wandering seekers uh, with kind of a free lunch program um, that was understood in that culture. But the, in any case, the Buddha embraced that. So the, for thousands of years, the monks, monks and nuns have depended on generosity of people around them. And um, you know, I remember I once went to visit uh, Wat Metta, this monastery, Theravada monastery of Tanisaro Bhikkhu in uh, San Diego. And I was talking to him about, about various things. And he said um, that he felt like a moon, like his uh, monastery was like a moon colony um, mm. because they were mostly supported by um, uh, Thai immigrants, Thai mm. people who understood that from their culture. And it was beautiful. They would come and cook and it was a whole community. Um, but he was pointing out that this culture doesn't have this tradition. And most of the uh, meditation centers, which are quite wonderful in, in so many ways that were in the first wave of retreat centers in the West charged money, not all of them, but I think all of the ones that offered long intensive retreats charged money. Mm -hmm. um, and I could have charged money. You know, there were people signed up for this past retreat and they were going to pay, I think, $6,000 or something for three months. And that could have been fine. You know, it would still have been a wonderful experience. But the Donna or generosity system, yeah, as I was inspired to embrace it. And as I did, I, I just, I keep unfolding. Oh, there's so much wisdom to this. It's like, um, it forces me not to have such rigid lines in terms of uh, running a business, <laughs> you know, it's like, it forces me to actually um, privilege relationships. And, you know, if, if there's not a strong enough actual community of people who really trust me and trust what we're doing, that's the end, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it also helps me to hold things more lightly. You know, I was, I was talking with someone named Beth Upton uh, the other month, and we were talking about Donna, and I was saying, I don't know if I should have done this. <laughs> it's so uncertain. Mm -hmm. And she said, Yeah, she said, just like the Dharma. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is that is the Dharma. It's uncertainty. So it's actually a great practice. It's mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could say more, but Donna is generosity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What uh, What's happened to practically? in the next year or so, like what kinds of things do you need in order to continue this project at this time? Yeah. So it costs about $3,000 per um, three month retreat, um, which covers like mostly it's about food, um, tents, infrastructure, supplies, things like that. So it's not including any sort of salary to me. Um, and so, yeah, we're, uh, I want to add two more tent sites um, so that we'd be able to serve uh, seven people at a time um, for this coming spring practice period and then the fall practice period after that. Um, yeah, so that adds up. Uh, so I wanna gather money together at least for that spring practice period um, so that I can start uh, inviting people who apply um, also interested in people um, who want to apply. It's already filled up a little bit, but there's uh, definitely spots and, you know, to write me and let me know your interest. If you want to do that, you should do that this summer. Um, and also skills in other ways, like you uh, have stepped forward and been so helpful this past year uh, in, with your time and, and uh, skills. So that's other ways of contributing. 
Uh, but right now it's basically uh, people and funding for the next upcoming retreat. And then in the longer term, um, it's funding ongoing retreats. Um, I think actually this is a pretty affordable kind of thing in the world as our, as our kind of circle of support grows, really just small donations will add up and cover the cost of this beautiful thing to just keep going each year. Um, which I really want to keep just offering this as much as I have energy for because I think it it works so well. That was my feeling from the last retreat. It totally worked. I just want to continue this thing. And uh, the last thing I would mention is just that, yeah, after this next year of two practice periods, we'll need to find a new space to do it in. Uh, and I'd like to find a space that's beautiful. Uh, could be anywhere in the world, but beautiful nature. I think nature is a complement to Dharma and also be able to um, house 10 to 15 people. So uh, I think that's probably the, the maximum that I could support with the same level of um, involvement and care. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of four ways that people could help. They could uh, give money. And so it's $3,000 per retreat. And then that's Yes. If I'm correct, like that's 21,000 for the retreat in the spring and then more money for the fall retreat that you want to do that's two months. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And then um, people can also apply to sit a retreat with you. Yep. And then um, they could offer their skills to help. And then lastly, you're looking for land, not for next year, but for after that. Yeah, that's a very nice summary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure I get that right. Yeah, I would just want to say as well, like what my own role in this has been maybe reflect a little bit about that, that um, last year, someone introduced me to you and said that there was this project that you were working on and that you wanted to run retreats and give people that opportunity. And uh, partly I was coming from just having had the opportunity to do a similar retreat myself and knowing how precious and valuable that was for me. And in a way that's, to some extent, I think very hard to communicate if you haven't had that opportunity it's like this is something that there's like a clear before and after yeah. with one yeah. of those retreats and um it's really obvious to me now like how a lot of the perspective that i'm lending to my different projects now comes from that opportunity to have had a retreat like that and that kind of training and so i wanted to be like yes we, this this is something that should be available to people and north <laughs> wants to do that and um have been helping with the with the fundraising in particular, but also other things. And uh, can I can I just interject mm -hmm. that just it is related to Donna, you know, that 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 joy that you feel, I mean, the people who have been most supportive to this to this project, it's like there's either been there's either been no support or there have been people who have experience with this kind of thing and they're just like yes great wonderful <laughs> hooray you know? and so you know it, it, it's really a sign of you know i think how new in this and even though a lot of people know about dharma not so many people have sat long retreats and just had that clear feeling that this is like oh yes like great 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 more of that mm -hmm. uh that's so natural when you have so uh, i do hope that more people feel that way and i imagine they will yeah, and uh, I mean, especially since you're offering people that opportunity, then they get to see that for themselves. And I think, yeah, yeah it's occurring to me in a way that's almost just, I think that that kind of extended retreat really opens someone up where it's like, yeah, their, their aspiration comes to life and they can't, they can't block it as much. It's just like the flowering yeah. of the person comes through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, that's, it can seem like this, I think to a lot of people, it just, it uh, sounds or lands as this kind of esoteric, self-absorbed sort of thing that they don't understand. Um, and really what I wanna kind of communicate is that I think that this is, um, this kind of thing is a really um, essential response to the suffering in the wider world, you know, and, and um, it's bringing forth compassion, not mm -hmm. self-absorption. It's not just personal peace. It's bringing forth compassion and um, it's bringing that into the world. Um, and it's doing that at a, at a, I think in a way, I'm not saying it's the only way or the, the best way, but it's what I, I see that it's, um, it's the way that has the most value in 
my life, what I've seen, this, this compassion that's connected with aspiration. Um, for some people to touch into, um, you know, like Gil Fronsdale talks about how retreat is like, kind of like the equivalent of a national park, but for the heart. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like the wilderness of the heart or the, the wildness, the practice of the wild. Um, it's preserving some possibility, you know, for some people to touch that it's a, it is a kind of, it is a kind of light and it's kind of, yeah, because this is something that we all share, um, this, uh, awareness that's really, really, really free from all the different, uh, shallow and deep ideas and every possible thing that could float through that we think, oh, this is who I am. Uh, this is what's happening to yeah so to have that to to embody that possibility as a sangha and in practice but also to have people come through and really touch that in a deep way and and hopefully some of them maybe all of them bring that in forward in their life be you know the effect of that is very big um and uh, so in a way the kind of small concentrated conditions um you know cloistered away um it uh is it is a boundary it's setting a boundary it's putting up a gate um and doing special practice but um for the purpose of something that's wide open Hmm. and to send people out transmitting that all over the place (laughs) yeah yeah i love that It's, it's like not obvious in our culture i think that like spending time alone or in quiet or sort of seclusion would be something that would uh, be of such deep and wide benefit. But uh, I think I could, I could certainly see that really clearly in my own life. And then you could see that in your life. And then, yeah, coming even just for a week um, to practice with you, it was like, there were, I think you had three long-term retreats this last time, sort of a sort of a initial run of the thing. And uh, it was like, oh, these people are being very, very, touched by this practice it was very clear Mm. yeah yeah they were they they were and it was that was that was the most satisfying thing that I could see was hearing from each of them afterwards and how much it had touched them and um you know words like yeah I mean yeah so that was the most satisfying thing someone who looked at me as as she was uh about to fly away Mm. uh and um she said, this was, you know, this was the most, uh, this was the most important thing I've ever done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, it was really just, I don't do it for praise at all. It, but it's nice to, it's nice to hear that people appreciate it in that way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What? I'm trying to think of this, this question. It, definitely a theme here that like the questions that are on my heart here are very Good. tricky <laughs> to put into words, but Good when you're working with people as a teacher what it seems like the purpose that i'm hearing for you in teaching is to help people have the same kind of shift and transformation that you've had and give create the conditions where that's possible what what is it that you are looking for or that you see if and when that happens for one of your students yeah well um, the, I think that I think that um, what am I looking what am I looking for? It's see it's you know in some way it's as I'm pausing because in some ways it feels very clear and very intuitive. On another way, you know, like I think of one old Thai abbot who said that he if he thinks that someone has awakened he waits about seven years, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, so there, there's that side too. Uh, You've got to really see what's actually changed. Sometimes it's hard to tell because, you know, my experience was that everyone who came through this retreat for a short or a long time had a meaningful intuition of awakened awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, Intuition is one thing a breakthrough is another or you know real transformation that endures with you and is free from words and concepts but is just you it's just it uh that 
that's another thing. Um, I, I do think that that happened to one person on the one of the three month retreatants, which was very encouraging to me. But I don't, part of me is you know, like, I, part of me is like that, okay, wait seven years. But, but part of me is also, you know, it was very clear in the moment. It was just like this, you know, it was even, it was clear to me before it was clear to him. Mm. <laughs> you know, I just, I just said, you know, you're free. And, and then we kept testing that over the next, you know, five weeks or something, mm. various ways. And, um, and the more he looked into what had opened up in his consciousness, what had simply become apparent in his consciousness, the more he looked at that, he saw, oh, this is totally free from greed, hate, and delusion. This is, this is welcoming. This is the Dharma. This is um, total acceptance. This is um, that, that suddenly, also what I wanna say is that um, the teachings didn't make sense to him in the same way anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this person had been so gung ho for like um, practices, so sincere, but for, but for uh, practices to try to get something. And those just didn't make sense in the same way anymore. He could do them, he was free to do them, but he was also free not to do them because this, this abiding presence had um, been established, mm. you know. And, and that opened up a lot of joy for this person. It opened up a lot of um, compassion for this person and a real ease of being, which was apparent and we both were celebrating. Mm, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's why this project should exist is, I mean, of course, for those transformations, even, even just the intuition, as you say, for anyone that comes through, but really for, for, for that kind of experience to be possible. And, what just just and 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 sorry to ask this again, but what was it that you saw when you said you're free? Like, what did you see? What is your experience of that? Mm. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um, you know, it's intuition, right? So it's maybe maybe I'll remember the actual answer, but it's but it was it was a sense of. Um, uh, I don't remember the specifics, but I think in the moment it was just a, a heart resonance. You know, it, it's going to come back to me. I'll, 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 but I don't actually remember the specifics. But mm-hmm. yeah, I would say just a heart resonance with because that's what I'm doing in the meetings. Is really, you know, that's one of the rituals in Zen, which is uh, meeting uh, individually with the teacher. So it's. Um, you know, I was watching your other interview with Corey Hess, mm. uh, which was great. And this, I never heard this word, I think it was Khufu, which mm. is like creative kind of interaction, spontaneous interaction, something like that. Yeah. So we, so I'm just trying to get, get to this, like in the context of having met with this person once or twice a day mm. for seven weeks <laughs> <laughs> in this, in this setting where it's, really not so much about the language, but it's about this dynamic interaction, this embodied meeting. Mm. Um, that's what came out of me. Mm. And it, you know, so it's hard for, might've even been hard for me to point to in the moment, what was it that I saw, but that wasn't something I'd said before. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Mm. But it probably was something to do with him reporting something to do with um, understanding the teachings in a new way I think, yeah, there were a number of things. At one point, I actually sent this person off to uh, not meet with me for a whole week, which mm-hmm. I didn't do with anyone else. It was just kind of, it was actually after I told him he's free. I said, why don't you take a week and just see, just, it was like, I, I didn't, I didn't want to kind of to be influencing him in any way. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, he came back and, and uh was just laughing because he was like my you know my thinking mind I'm, I'm letting my thinking mind happen in all sorts of ways that I would never have done before mm. but there's some faith here you know it's like there's this this abiding presence that's opened up um, was also clear to him so he was giving his like Suzuki Roshi says if you want to control your mind give the cows of your thoughts a wide pasture mm. um, uh, he was experimenting, oh, giving these cows a wider pasture and just appreciating the 
pastureness of it all. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. What a, yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just moved hearing about this. It's like such a such a gift for that person and for the people that will be in their life and and for the other people that have had a chance to practice with you. So, <sighs> um, is there anything else that you'd like to share about your project or about your life or talk more about or uh, ask about or anything like that? Hmm. Let me think about that for a moment. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is just talking with you as more of a conversation about the implications of practice in the in the wider world, and because um, I know that's something you're really passionate about um, and hold in such an inspiring way. Uh, you know, living with loving kindness and loving curiosity. Mm -hmm. And, and helping other people, you know, it really was uncommon, really strike, continues to strike me, but how you've devoted your actual time, uh, you know, like to your, your actual time to help, just helping someone else bring their vision into being. I think that takes, you know, for me, it's like, this is my vision, you know, it's like, and it's, a, and I think it's a good thing. And we both, and that's true. But I actually really reflect on your generosity to help bring other people's projects into being. And so I don't know how that, how, um, what that opens up, but I just wanted to talk about maybe more about aspiration and um, what are we bringing forward in the world that goes beyond our, our different projects and includes them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, two, two things come to mind hearing you talk about that first is, um, you know, and I would love to hear more from you about how you hold the Bodhisattva vows and what you think about that. And I'm, I'm just reminded of like, there was a period of about two years before I took, well, at three years before I took the Bodhisattva vows, but like two years where I was basically in a fear of them. I was like, wow, I had some friends that were, that took them and I was very inspired by that. And I was like, I can't do that. That's not for me. That's how could I possibly vow to save all beings? Like one, that's hard anyway, but definitely not me. I can't do that. And um, eventually I remember I was at a retreat in the fall of 2017 and just, I forget what preceded it, but just realized like, I have to give up on that resistance. And this is the only thing that makes sense. And like, yes, I may not be able to do it. I may not even understand what it is, but it's the only <laughs> thing that makes sense. And um, I decided to take them then, and it was about, you know, maybe nine months or eight months or something before I could actually take them in a ceremony. But um, uh, one of the things that shifted was just like a very simple way of seeing the Bodhisattva vows, which I, I think I have maybe two or three main ways of seeing them. But one of them is just very simple, which is just, okay, this, this life, this body, this time, this energy is for service. That's what this uh -huh. life is about. And if I'm giving my time and energy and my life to being of service, then that's that's it. it it's like that's that's still hard but it's also straightforward it's like either i'm doing it or i'm not and yeah so i want to live a life how of service how do yeah. you know how do you feel do you feel like you're always living a life of service or how do you make that what does that show up for you in a daily basis where you can tell this is of service or this is not hmm. well i've had to find what that means for me and that's an ongoing question but one of it is like um, I mean, for one, I don't, I don't have an ordinary job. I find that really helpful. I don't think like when I've tried to fit into like a nine to five or a traditional job, it feels that feels like constricting to my ability to be of service in a real way. And so I found it useful to live based on generosity. I mean, I have a Patreon and it's mm -hmm. like the way I experience that is like, Hey, if you think that I'm helping the world, then like trust, you can support that and trust that I'll use that energy to be of service and in ways that make sense to me. And importantly, that are um, ways that fit my skills and mm -hmm. also like things that I enjoy doing. I don't know, like that's been yeah. very important to find ways that I enjoy being of service. Yeah. Yeah, enjoy, yeah, enjoyment, enjoy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been an interesting part of, ongoing part of my 
journey and joy, you know, what's the, what's the role of joy? Joy is, joy is connected to our individual being, isn't it? It's like our particular psychology and um, certainly there can be clinging involved with pleasure, but, um, but there's something about like joy. What do you mean joy? You know, it's like, I heard one, one, uh, uh, Ajahn Suchito, Suchito was talking about how the mind likes pleasure. That was a beautiful expression. Um, and that we, sh we, we don't need to fight that. We can use that um, in a sense, but it's this, uh, and, and what, we, what we enjoy, what we find pleasant is particular to us. Um, but if we don't have that nourishment, if that nourishment isn't connected, uh, you know, we start to get depressed and, um, or, or feel like we're not doing what we should be doing or something. And um, so I just, yeah, I don't know what the question is, but like, what's the connection I wonder between joy and aspiration? I, I'd be interested to kind of explore that together. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's like a signal for me. It, it feels like what almost like, um, like the metaphor that's coming to mind is like I'm looking for food in an alley and it's like oh I smell food over there I'm like to go in that direction uh <laughs> it's like uh a very it's a very visceral like almost animal thing of like oh I find that yeah. I'm enjoying this and I'm not enjoying that I should probably do the thing that I enjoy and feel energized and enlivened by that that's something yeah. I could do yes um, are we, are, you know, good. We were breaking up for a second, yes. I think we're back. But, but yeah, what that, what that brings to my mind, though, is this sign of, because um, I totally get, that's a big part of my practice. Like I've struggled with um, depression for mm -hmm. my whole life in different, at different times in different ways. And being able to tune into joy and build a life that has as much joy as possible is really been like the main, it's, it's an art and it takes sensitivity. It's not like as simple as popping a pill in my experience. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like you need to learn what really brings you alive but i think that that I, I ask because how does that connect with aspiration because i think the joy of us i think that aspiration is very joyful mm -hmm. but it's not joyful in the same way as like that song that really hits you in the right way mm -hmm. um it's a subtler it's a subtler joy mm -hmm. it's a bigger joy but it's a it's a more, it's a continuous joy. It's not the joy of up, up and down uh, pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it has a joyful quality in my experience, a, a buoyant quality or a quality of um, uh, refreshment or something like, or of like, yes, I will. Like, even if this is hard, I can, like, there's this opening here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know what you mean. I think it does have that and I think I think there's like a practical way that I'd suggest someone look for this which is like I, I don't know was, Peace Pilgrim has been very helpful for me and she said she said about doing every good thing that she thought of and something that someone could sort of practically do to just to notice this is like maybe list out five or six things that they might like to do that would be of service in the world like what could I do to be of service and then look at that list and it's like well which of those would actually be fun for me like these are all things that would be of benefit but which one would be the fun thing to do I'd enjoy this one more than that one so do that one you know uh -huh. I love that that's that's beautiful I mean, we can you know that's I think that's one of the things I've appreciated about you and and I think that we share in common is this is um that that kind of um, creative visioning for our life mm -hmm. um you know um i'm sure there's all kinds of causes and conditions that led to us both wanting to do that and being able to do that but but this but to um and this is related to aspiration what does it take to sit down and make that list and actually act on it what does it take to because uh, i think i've always been a person who has been kind of um uh, well, as one of my teachers called me stubborn mm. um, <laughs> with a smile, but it was, <laughs> but you know, it's like, what is that? Um, it's mysterious, but what is that kind of uh, quality that gives us the chutzpah mm. or the inspiration or something mm. to not just feel like, oh, it'd be nice to make that list, but I've got to go to that nine, nine to five job and there's no other way for me. Mm. Hmm. I don't know. I really don't know. 
I, I don't know what differentiates that. I, I mean, something that comes to mind, this, this is this is a very indirect answer to your question, but I'm reminded yeah. of once my teacher, Soryu, told this story of like, he was talking about how on retreat, um, you know, you have all these ideas come to you. And he's like, well, they're not very good ideas. And like, you know, uh, <laughs> it's not the time to do the ideas that you think of on retreat. And and then he said something from Chisan, I think, actually, who's the assistant to Harada Roshi and also yeah. Roshi herself now about yeah. like, I forget what what he said. And this is, you know, me paraphrasing my memory of him, <laughs> paraphrasing her, but uh, something something like um, people don't do half the ideas that they think of on retreat and it would be maybe it would be better if they did them or something like that and yeah. I guess for some reason I, I don't I don't remember exactly what he said but the way that that landed for me was like you know what actually I think there are things I think of on retreat are good ideas and I'm <laughs> going to do them and so I would write them down uh and sometimes pages and pages of them like many ideas <laughs> and then I would actually do them I would oh do great them. <laughs> uh, and and you know what that actually worked out well for me I think Yes. The projects yes. that I thought of were yes. they ended, like some of them were bad ideas, but most of them like they got better yes. and better and like helped people. And because yes. I was like I built up the sense of acting on the ideas that I had, it was yes. like I knew that I would. I, there was a trust there. I'd say. Oh well, that that's great that you say that because it reminds me of two things. One is the retreat project arose from you've frozen now you're back mm. this is retreat project arose from stillness um from when i had that big transformation i had a series of images they were just mind images they're just ideas right but the main one was actually teaching long intensive retreat and so in a way it was like the next 12 years was and still continuing is like growing into this big vision that came mm -hmm. it's not the it's not the practice itself but it's yeah honoring those visions because they are particular and um i mean i'd like to see a world where we honored our visions and dreams and imaginations more while understanding their limitations mm -hmm. the other thing it brings to mind is you know i, I mentioned briefly kaz tanahashi but i wanted to tell this story he's a great zen teacher and activist and artist and writer um, and he came through Tassajara one summer um, and I was just in, drawn to him. And so when I left the monastery at a later time, I just looked him up online and emailed him and said, can I meet you? And he said, yes. So, and I went to go meet him and um, watched him paint and had tea with him and helped him fix his computer. And um, just the day kept unfolding. But one of the things that really struck me is that as we were having tea, he had a little uh, notepad mm -hmm. and he, as he would have ideas, he or we would have ideas together, he'd just write them down. And I had the sense that he was gonna do those things. I mean, this is a guy who like makes art and books and all these things. He was like 90 something years old, very sprightly, very joyful. That meeting changed me. Um, also, I had been involved in activism work and had gotten to the point where I just felt like there's not a lot of hope here mm. and I don't and also I want to help but it seems like you know organizing activist events is not my great gift in life because <laughs> um, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I could see the people who could do that well and I wasn't one of them and um, but he was he was aware of you know the threat of nuclear war and climate disaster and all these things for a long time and he, so he was aware of that, but he was also in the very joyful. And he also was this, it was this transmission of joy also around like honoring the ideas that come, that come up and follow them, do them, try to, try to make them, try to put them out there. It was a subtle thing, but it really changed my life and was a meaningful transmission. What that's something about it's like in Zen, they say you have to you have to say something. There's that expression. It's like what happens when we actually take that step and take another step into because it's into relationship. It's into um, you know. It's like when you when you you have a practice of drawing. So when you draw, um, you could have a wonderful vision. But I mean, I know when I was a kid and I would draw. I would cry after drawing class because I'd say, I can't make the thing that's in my mind. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's a known problem. 
<laughs> and I think you know, but 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 it's so um, it's so sad to just have the vision. It's isolating to have the vision and not make make it make a flawed mark. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it ta it takes something else. Um, I don't know what I'm getting at here, but it's important. I think it's at least it's important to me because it's like for me, I think a big part of suffering is disconnection. It's tendency to disconnect. It could be uh, as simple as through like a messy room, but it's like turning away from taking care of what's actually here. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just one small example, but to really, uh, to it relates to teaching, it relates to all of this. It's like, um, to, to make, to, 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 to say something, to make a mark, to try something that comes from your heart, um, it opens you, it opens one up to feedback. It opens, it, 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 it opens up um, your own limitation. It shows your limitation. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. I think there's something there about like scale too of um, almost like difficulty level and like, yeah, no, say you're aware like, oh, there's nuclear weapons and there's global warming. It's like, those are, oh, did I lose you again? Oh, there we go. Um, th those are enormous problems. Yeah, but now you're back. Yeah. I mean, some, some of these problems that we face are enormous yes. and yes, it's like, well, what does one person do about that? Yes. But, if we, if you look at the smallest scale, like, for example, um, I thought of the other day of a gift that I could give someone, a small gift that would cost $10. It's like, you know, I should give that gift to that person. It's like small. <laughs> and if we, if we, I think if we, if we trust the things that we know we can do, yes. then that leads to good things. And then if we, on the other hand, if we dishonor the things because, oh, they're small, or maybe it's not a good idea. It's like we build up a habit of that so for me i've had to yes build a habit of trusting my ideas even the small ones even the ones that don't make sense and yes. then that's expanded my capacity of what's possible of like i've gained new skills and more things have opened up of what i might be able to do because i've done even the small things yeah. or the things yeah. that don't make sense that's great that's beautiful yeah it, um, it reminds me of how you you had one comment, I think, on your Twitter that really stuck with me, where you said most projects underestimate, overestimate what they can do in one year, and they mm -hmm. underestimate what they can do in five. Mm -hmm. And so I've just kept that in my mind as we've been working together. Um, yeah, and um, so yeah, there's, there's questions of scale. There was something else around um, relationship. Oh, I was just noticing how we both became very animated as we were talking about mm -hmm. uh, aspiration and creativity and joy and how that relates to the bigger problems in the world or somehow, somehow, but somehow kind of alive to me is like this, um, connect, you know, connections between people because I think it's, it's intimately related to this free or awakened awareness that's, um, we, we become isolated around our ideas, which we attach to, I think. So I think that to whatever extent we're in touch with um, spirit or with, uh, with our authentic self, um, it allows, it, it kind of facilitates or stimulates this um, connection at a deeper level, at a human level, rather than a level of tribe or um, religious affiliation, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, yeah. I'm reminded of, um, it, it seemed like you were asking earlier a question of something like why, I don't know exactly how you were trying to put it, but something of like, wh why would I help your project? For example, if you have your vision, like, why would I, why would I help? Um, did I lose you again there? Okay. Um, yes. was that a yes, question that you were going to yeah, ask? I thought well, I, I, I know t t some, some, yeah, it's on, along the same lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More or less. How would you put it? Um, it's, it's more like, 
No, how do you, how do you, um, is it your special gift to help other people? Is it one of your special gifts to help people do what they want to do? Or uh, sometimes I feel, sometimes I feel like part of my karma has been to be quite absorbed in, in my, my vision. Mm -hmm. It's like that, that has a good side, which is that I can be kind of visionary and, you know, kind of, uh, but, but it has the downside that it's a little bit um, selfish. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I admire, I, you know, I say, I say that lightly, but I admire how you really show up to help. I really question what I, how, how am I showing up to help someone else's vision or join with someone else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I asked because I, I could, I was remembering that, but I'm, I wanted to hear how you would phrase it. But I think really in the last months, I've wanted to add this as one of the things that I'm doing of what I'm calling empowerment, which is related to this idea of an aspiration or a vow, because um, the more that I look at people as having this, if everyone has one, then the thing that makes sense to me to do is like know what people's are and see if I can help them. And I can't help everyone, but like I'm in a position to help some people with bringing about their vow. And I want to do that if I am. I love that. And it's just, I mean, it's connected with Donna and the spirit of Donna somehow. Mm -hmm. um, this, um, and it's connected with teaching, but somehow um, it just feels very pro-social. It's like, <laughs> it feels like very, if more people could be like, that. I feel like great entrepreneurs are, are like that in some way. And some of some of have that quality it's like that we can be more um you know by helping others we can actually be more fulfilled more happy um that it that in a sense like the dalai lama says it's selfish to help others it's like i don't know if i like that so much because selfish but it's like that it's good it's a good thing um yeah yeah, I like the word self-oriented because it doesn't yeah. have that negative moral connotation. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and it's also, I think it's also a real answer to the question, both of how you solve global problems from a practical perspective, which many people are concerned with, but also from a bodhisattva perspective, like how do you actually save all beings? Like it's an answer to that because yeah. you you help the people that you can help as many as you can. And like, yes, that might not be the same as like yourself removing global warming or yourself removing nuclear weapons, or it might not be the same as saving all and every being, but you help all of the ones that you can and do, do your best. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> and just seeing how you smile when you talk about it. And like I said, we got so animated when we talk about it because something in us is doing this and is operating this way, trusting that, celebrating that. And I think that there's, yeah. So I just, I pray anyway, I just pray for more of that in my, uh, I want to, I want to live that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I want, um, I'm not going to force other people to live that way, mm -hmm. but I want to live in a way that encourages other people to live that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really would be so great. It's, it's, a, it's a great, it's great to even aspire. It's great to even head in that orient in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, because I think there's a there's all and there's also just related to the problems of the world. I think there's the quality of there's a quality of non worry in that too. It's like, um, okay, maybe the maybe we don't solve everything, and maybe we do, but I'm going to make this offering. Um, yeah, when I was in when I was in South Africa, I met a sh a great shaman named Mandaza. I had just arrived at this center and I was feeling um, jet lagged and I was also feeling um, anxious um, because I was there with the founders and I just felt like this is my first kind of real kind of teaching gig and um, I just felt anxious and a new culture and I was going and hiking in the mountains and I saw some, bam uh, some uh, baboons somersaulting down the mountain. And uh, I think we froze. Oh, now we're back. Yeah, you said you saw um, some baboons. And baboons, yeah. And so then I was back at lunch that day, and I told people about that. And and uh, then there was some agitation about the baboons coming too near to the center. Mm. Anyway, Mandaza said, you should go give them a banana. Mm. Um, 
And I was feeling sort of anxious at the time. So I said, is there some special way that I'm supposed to give them the banana? Like, this is, <laughs> and he said, no, he said, just give them the banana. He said, you don't even have to like put it in their hands, just leave it on the rock near where they are. Just, and, but when he said that, just give them the banana, everyone laughed. Cause it was just like, just, that was so much his teaching was just make your offering. Yes. And what was interesting was when I did it, then I did it and I was trudging up the mountain thinking like, how did I end up here? <laughs> I mean, really? And then, uh, but I took the banana and I just remember holding it from my heart and just placing it on this rock near where the baboons were. And um, as soon as I let it go, I felt this real shift, this settling, this joy. Um, and I thought of that many times since. It was a spontaneous ritual that he created, but I thought of it many times since because, um, yeah, just make your offering and that's a good way. And you don't really know, you're not in control of the result. That's basic wisdom. <laughs> mm. So true, so yeah. true. Yes, I love that story. I love that story. So anyway, thanks yeah. for giving me uh, this time and your time and it's been good to be together. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for speaking with me, Nori.